This video will be a review of the New Living Translation Catholic Reader's Edition. It's hardback. It is 9 and 5 sixteenths inches tall, 6 and 5 sixteenths inches wide, and 1 and 7 sixteenths inch thick. Uh, to give you a sense for those dimensions, here is a medium size New American Bible Revised Edition. Not quite as tall, a bit thicker. Here is the uh, Augustine Bible. It's the ESV Catholic Edition. Similar in height and in thickness and width. And here is a Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition from Ignatius. And again, similar in terms of layout. The uh, text is laid out into two columns and they're formatted into paragraphs, as you see. Each column here is between 59 and 60 millimeters wide. I think it's about 59 and a half. And I count on a closely packed line about 49 characters per line. I think I found one with 51 characters. There can be as many as 56 lines in a column. The page dimensions are 229 millimeters top to bottom. Left to right is 152 millimeters, so that's right at 9 inches tall and 6 inches wide. The text is line matched. You may be able to see that here. You see the print from the other side is lined up there with the text on this side. And I think the print is nice and sharp. It's well done. And it is somewhat bold. At the top of the page, the margin is 19 to 20 millimeters wide. The inner margin here at the front and the back of the book is about 13 millimeters. It's less than that here. The outer margin varies between 13 and 17 millimeters. And at the bottom of the page, below the, lo the lowest descender of the text in the footnotes, it can be 12 to 13 millimeters wide. The font in the text, uppercase letters look to be about eight and a half points tall when I compare them to Times New Roman. Lowercase letters are more like nine points, and this text is advertised as a nine point font. If you're like me, you think the line height is fairly generous. It looks well spaced, and in fact, when I measure it, I get right at 10 points, 3.52 millimeters from baseline to baseline. So it's well spaced. Verse numbers are in black, and they're fairly easy to small find, even though they are small. They're, um, in this translation, words that are added by the translators for clarity, and there are a lot of them. This is a very free translation. Those words are not in italic font and pronouns for deity are not capitalized in the New Living Translation. So, for instance, here at the beginning of Romans, you'll see his, which refers to God, and his again here. Those uh, pronouns are not capitalized in this translation. There are no references in this edition. This is not a reference Bible. It does have page-bottom notes, and so we'll turn to see some of those. So here's a page bottom note. This have to do with the text and the translation. So here, they are in about a seven point font. And so you can see the sense of the note here. Here's one on 1 Corinthians 2.10. Some manuscripts read four. And on 2.13, uh, they give you an alternate translation explaining spiritual truths in spiritual language. I like the paper quite a lot. I measure the sheet thickness at 41.2 micrometers, so I estimate the paper weight at 37.6 GSM. So my guess is it's probably about 36. The surface is very nearly matte so there isn't much of a directed sheen off the paper, more of a diffuse glare, which is much better for reading. Paper is slightly beige, it's just a little bit off-white. 
there is noticeable show through. But because the text is line matched, I for one do not find it uh, particularly distracting. The print isn't quite as uniform as I would like. I would characterize it as definitely noticeable and not uncommon. You can see that page 7 here on the right is quite a lot darker than page 5 on the left. But page 5 is perfectly readable. I just wish it had been printed like page 7 throughout the volume. Each book is printed with an introduction. This is the introduction to Numbers. It has a text about the book itself. Then it gives you the author, date written, purpose, themes, and then a brief outline. So you can find a particular section that discusses a particular topic fairly easily. Book titles are in the upper outside of the page, which makes it easy to navigate through the book as you're flipping through. Page contents are here as well, so chapter 14 begins on this page. Page numbers are in the inside margin at the top of the page. There are headings in the text. They are in a relatively bold, italic, nine-point font. Chapter numbers are large and bold, and they span about two lines of text. As far as I can tell, all the books of the Bible begin on a separate refresh page. So if you look back at the small books like Jude, 3rd John, you will have an introduction for each of those. I am happy to see that the words of Christ are printed in a very nice black ink, it's, which is the same darkness as the rest of the print. Quotations from the Old Testament that appear in the New Testament are sometimes offset from the text separate paragraph separated from the rest of the text like this, but sometimes they are embedded in the paragraphs. Some translations like the New American Standard Bible would print an Old Testament quotation in all capital letters. I believe the Christian Standard Bible does it in a bold font, which makes them easier to find. It's not that easy here. When you come to the end of the book of Revelation, formerly known as the Apocalypse, you find six blank sheets between the end of the text and the maps. There's no concordance. There's no map index. There are nine color maps. They're on glossy paper. The maps do not enter the gutter. They're only moderately detailed. Not a lot of detail there on these maps, but uh, I think they're attractive. Here you go. You can see here that it does not enter the gutter. You have a space there, so you can see all the all the locations on the map without having to dig into the gutter to find them. And after the maps, you have a couple of pieces of cardstock. Then you have a textured liner made of paper. This is clearly a glued text block. Um, there is no sign of stitching, and there is glue here near the headband and the tail band. Um, there is one ribbon marker. Let's see if we can get that to focus. It is long enough to come out here at the corner to make it useful. The ribbon marker is thin, though. It's only five millimeters wide. It's 32 centimeters long. It is double-faced satin, so it's shiny on both sides and it's kind of a royal blue. In the front of the book you have the same textured paper liner and more card stock, a presentation page, a couple of title pages, title page number two, printed by Tyndall House Publishers. It's interesting that a Catholic Bible is printed by Tyndall House, which shows that we've come quite a long way in the last 500 years. It's the copyright page. A number of people are interested in whether Catholic Bibles have the correct permissions, the nothing obstructs, and the let it go forth. I would say a nihil obstat and imprimatur. Someone will correct me if I mispronounce them. It's the copyright information. This copy is printed in Italy you see down here, and it appears to be the first printing from 2017. 
here are the contents so you may be asking does it have all the books in the right order well if you come here you see you have Tobit and Judith after Nehemiah then after Esther you have first and second Maccabees you have uh, wisdom Ecclesiasticus and Baruch Baruch coming after Lamentations and I think that's it and if you're looking for them in alphabetical order, after the tables of contents, one comes to the introduction. Uh, they say that they're not word for word or uh, thought for thought, uh, but somewhere in between. But I believe this is a very free translation as translations go. Where it, what uh, text source, source text did they use? Text behind the New Living Translation, the Old Testament used the Masoretic text. Um, but they stray from, from it quite a bit, and I'll show you a chart regarding that a little bit later. New Testament is from uh, UBS 4, 4th edition, or NA 27. <clears throat> but they also exercise quite a lot of editorial free, freedom there. For the deuterocanonical books, they used uh, Rolf's Septuagint from 1979. Then, of course, there are choices within that. For Tobit, they used uh, so Codex Sinaiticus as their primary text. For the additions to Daniel, it's like uh, Bell and the Dragon and the Song of the Three Young Men. They used the Greek text of Theodosian. And, of course, Theodosian's translation of Daniel was the one preferred by the early church. Now, some of the translation choices here are somewhat unusual. For uh, weights and measures, um, they've converted to modern English American equivalents, which means that they lose the numerical value associated with those measures. Um, the names of Hebrew months, uh, they've mo transformed those into modern calendar names and then used footnotes uh, that give the literal Hebrew date. Um, Ancient references to the time of day have been replaced by the o'clock system that we use today. Um, they sometimes will include the meaning of a name in the text itself. So they say Ishmael, which, mean, which means God hears. They actually place that in the text. Um, so they were re replace uh, colorful phrases like beat their breasts with um, abstractions like they were in deep sorrow and metaphorical language that's difficult for contemporary readers to understand um, your neck is like the Tower of David we've rendered it your neck is as beautiful as the Tower of David to clarify the intended purpose so you're getting a sense, I think, of how free this translation is. Um, they don't always translate the Jews with the Jews, but sometimes they say the Jewish people, Jewish leaders, or the people. This uh, last paragraph in terms of translation issues is very interesting. They talk about the challenge of how to translate accurately the ancient biblical text that was originally written in a context where male-oriented terms were used to refer to humanity generally, as was done in English until the late 1960s. And so what they've done, of course, is uh, they've included the modern gender-neutral terms. So, for instance, they talk about how to translate brothers Adelphi. <clears throat> so that should refer to men and women, so they've gone with brothers and sisters in the text. Um, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not turn from it, has been. Direct your children into the right path, and when they are older they will not leave it. So there's a pluralization that's gone on there. And uh, then another approach is to go from third person to uh, second person. So he who digs a pit will fall into it has become, if you set a trap for others. So there's a section here about le lexical consistency and terminology, how they render the divine names. 
and um, they go with Messiah generally instead of Christ, except when the Gentile audience can be assumed, and then they go with Christ. There's quite a lot of textual footnotes in this translation. A number of them are quite useful. And then there's a brief note here about the Deuterocanonical books. Um, for the additions to Esther, they've used the designations A, B, C, D, and E. And then they've included um, the prayer of Azariah and the Song of the Three Young Men as verses 23 through 90 and chapter 3 of Daniel. Susanna is uh, chapter 13, and Bell and the Dragon is chapter 14. And then after the introduction, there is a list of translation team contributors segregated by books of the Bible. Deuterocanonical books appear to be the responsibility of these people. And after that listing, there's the Old Testament beginning and the introduction to the book of Genesis. Now the font is, um, there's nothing really special about it, but I find it sufficiently attractive. I like the darkness of the characters. The strokes seem to be broad enough. The uh, line spacing, as we've mentioned, is very generous, so that's a great aid to reading and comfort. And uh, I don't see any tracking issues. The characters seem to be sufficiently separated. So let's take a look at some other fonts. So on the left, I brought in the Ignatius Revised Standard Version 2nd Catholic Edition, which has a much creamier paper. The font here is roughly the same size, I think, but the RSV 2CE on the left has much thinner strokes in the characters. I find the text on the right easier to read. Now on the left is the Augustine Bible, the uh, ESV Catholic Edition. Similar sizes again. Um, and again, I think the font on the left is not quite as bold as that on the right. Certainly both are perfectly readable. And so finally now I have brought in on the left the New American Bible Revised Edition, the me medium-sized St. Joseph. You can see that the paper there has a slight blue tinge to it. The uh, font is smaller on the left a bit more difficult to read. I have yet to score this translation for literalness, so it is not yet on my translation continuum chart. I think when it does appear there, it will be somewhere to the right-hand side of the page, uh, beyond to the right of NIV 11. In terms of the New Testament text space, the New Living Translation agrees with Westcott and Hort 58.2% of the time and 153 verses I scored with the Nestle Elan 28th edition about the same frequency as the ESV does, 71.9% with Tyndall House 51.6% and with Robinson Pierpont 35.3% so as you can see from these charts, uh, this is the Tyndall House chart and this is the uh, West Cotton Hort chart. Uh, the New Living Translation is uh, certainly in the, in the same general cluster with a number of other modern translations. It is not a uh, Byzantine text type translations like the EOB, the Eastern Orthodox Bible New Testament, which appears in the lower left hand part of this chart. I have scored uh, the Old Testament for departures from the Masoretic text, looking in a hundred locations where there are known variants. So this is the latest edition of that chart, and you see the New Living Translation is there at uh, 41 departures from the Masoretic text out of 100. It's just to the right of the Revised New Jerusalem Bible, far to the right of the RSV Second Catholic Edition, and to the left of the New American Bible Revised Edition. Here's a, an example of where the New Living Translation could have followed 
the uh, Septuagint, but didn't. And so the Lord says, these people say they are mine, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, and their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules learned by rote. But it is neat, I think, that they do give translation from the Greek down below. Uh, 2913 note, Greek version reads, their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. And then here, they tell you that you can compare that to Mark 7-7, 7, 7, where it's being quoted. So let's see if we can flip to Mark 7-7 7, 7 quickly. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. So in case you, like uh, I, are not particularly familiar with the New Living Translation, I'll let you take a look at a few passages here. So here's the 23rd Psalm, the way it reads in the New Living Translation. So feel free to pause that and read that. Here is uh, Isaiah 11, uh, verses 2 through 5. And let's scroll down a bit. The next section about the wolf and the lamb. the tag end of that. Here's the beginning of Isaiah 53 in the New Living Translation. The beginning of the song of the three young men. This is the beginning of Tobit. Notice the uh, footnotes here. I think this is one of the strengths of this translation, that it does give uh, textual variants quite frequently. I don't know whether it does it more than the New Revised Standard Version or the Christian Standard Bible, but I do see quite a few of these notes. The beginning of the Magnificat in the New Living Translation. And this is the end of John's Gospel. So let me try to summarize. Um, I think this is actually a very good volume for its price. I believe I paid about $17 for it on uh, Christian book distributors. And um, my only real issue with it is the glued binding. But it does seem very sturdy. And I don't know if I remembered to do this, to show you this, but it lies open actually right here before you get to Genesis. So you can read this quite well. If your eyes aren't too old, the nine-point font should be satisfactory. If you're not uh, looking for a reference edition, then this, um, this should be adequate. It is a very interpretive translation. Um, one of these days, perhaps, I will finish scoring it and uh, post the new copy of my translation continuum and you'll have a better sense for just how free it is. But it is somewhat loose. It does use the modern gender inclusive language rather than the older gender inclusive language. Just for fun let's show you Revelation chapter 3 here. <clears throat> Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. The uh, paper is very good. Um, the print is uh, it's very nice and generally dark, although we did see some fading and non-uniformity. It has all of the Catholic books in the correct order. So um, with that, I think I will close the video. And uh, thank you again very much for watching. If you haven't already done so and are so inclined, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel. Thanks again.